The National Weather Service in the 21st century is empowered by technology to make predictions that it could not perform in its early years. The Weather Service began in 1870 when President Ulysses S. Grant created the agency under the auspices of the Army Signal Corps and the direction of the Secretary of War. It was assigned the responsibility of making meteorological observations, especially on the seacoast and the Great Lakes, and then relaying that information to other points in the continent and territories. The Weather Service first name gives ample description of why it was founded. The Division of Telegrams and Reports for the Benefit of Commerce. Unfortunately, the U.S. Weather Bureau, which was the name of the agency by 1900, was staffed by observers of varying degrees of relevant education and training. The equipment at their disposal was of modest capacity to detect immediate threats, so forecasts depended heavily on communication between various places. By knowing the typical direction of wind and weather systems, communication between observation points allowed personnel on the leeward side of a line of communication to know what kind of weather was moving in their direction. The use of barometers to measure changes in air pressure and anemometers to gauge wind speed gave observers some ability to make good predictions. However, the Bureau also made some terrible mistakes in failing to predict life-threatening storms. Such was the case in New York City on March 12, 1888. The weather for the city was predicted to be, and I quote, colder, fresh to brisk westerly winds and fair weather, end of quote. To the Bureau's embarrassing chagrin, the next day delivered the great blizzard of 88. Four feet of snow fell on Albany, New York, and 21 inches blanketed New York City and its boroughs. Some 200 New Yorkers died, while elsewhere in the Northeast, the storm claimed 200 more lives. Weather prediction was clearly not an exact science in 1900. <music> On the western shores of the Gulf of Mexico, few people feared weather systems from the east because the typical weather pattern was a west to east phenomenon, like from California to New York. Besides that, Coriolis, they thought, would send any would-be storms to the northeast. Weather observers in Cuba, the North American birthplace of modern hurricane forecasting, thought that the storm that had dropped several inches of precipitation on the island on September 5th and 6th, 1900, was a threat to points west in the Gulf. But the Weather Bureau in Washington, D.C. was convinced that the Coriolis effect would send the storm to the northeast along the coast where the Gulf Stream would likely sustain it as a powerful rainstorm, if not a hurricane. However, at 11.30 a.m. on Friday the 7th, the Weather Bureau notified its observers in Louisiana and Texas that a tropical storm was located south of Louisiana and was slowly moving northwest. For Isaac Klein, the Bureau's representative in Galveston, he would operate on the forecast spelled out in the telegram, and I quote, High northerly winds tonight and Saturday the 8th, with probably heavy rain, end of quote. As a southern center of fishing and shipping, Galveston in 1900 was equally rich in economic activity and culture. In fact, 45 steam lines connected Galveston to the outside world, including the White Star Line that would later become famous as the owner of the unsinkable Titanic. The town was wealthy enough to have electric streetcars, telephones, electricity and homes and businesses some 33 years before TVA was formed. Three big concert halls and 20 hotels, including the richly appointed Tremont. Its citizens were optimistically looking forward to the new century. <laughs> Given the town's encouraging economic future and the original name of the agency, it's no small wonder that the U.S. Weather Bureau operated an observation station on the island. As mentioned briefly above, the Galveston Weather Bureau was managed by Isaac Klein, an ambitious, smooth-talking storyteller from Monroe County East, in East Tennessee. Klein had studied for the ministry at Hiawassee College, a small two-year college located at nearby Madisonville. He later earned a medical doctorate and a Ph.D., the meteorologist and his family, including his younger brother Joseph, made up part of the population that the recently conducted census showed was just over 29,000 people. Galveston's economic vitality was seen in its population growth. The city had grown by 30% since 1890. 
However, despite being situated on a barrier island with the highest elevation a few inches shy of eight feet, the city's material splendor invited residents to dismiss thoughts of potential harm from nature. On the morning of September 8, 1900, the bustling little city and its optimistic residents were in jeopardy from a force of nature that few of them could have imagined. The wide expanse of relatively shallow water in the Gulf of Mexico had been bombarded by sunlight for a number of days as a stationary high pressure center settled in over the northern Gulf area, the Gulf states, the Midwest, and even the eastern seaboard. The oppressive mass of stationary air stretched far out into the Atlantic. Clear skies permitted sunlight to superheat the Atlantic and the Gulf. The atmosphere was priming itself for more energy transmission. Temperatures were in the 100 degree range in a number of East Coast cities. Philadelphia reached 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit at 3 p.m. on August 11th. On that same day in New York City, 30 people died from the heat, and sadly, three children who had sought relief from breezes on a fire escape fell to their deaths. In the Gulf of Mexico, the developing low pressure center sent warning signs in front of its march toward Galveston. In the hours before daylight on September 8th, Isaac Klein and his brother Joseph, who also worked for the U.S. Weather Bureau, were awakened and troubled by the thudding sounds they heard through their open windows. Unusually loud waves were crashing on the beach. This is peculiar because the normally placid gulf produced little more than the gentle wave action of a small lake. Concerned about the crashing sounds, Isaac, as he reported later, rose from, the bed, uh, from bed hours before daybreak and walked a few blocks to the beach. He observed large waves and a higher tide than normal. He also observed a strong north wind. Klein then went straight back to his downtown office and checked the station's weather instruments. Despite his feeling that something was terribly wrong, he decided that the evidence did not suggest a hurricane. In reality, the north wind should have told him that a powerful low pressure center was forming over the gulf. Nature abhors a vacuum, and a hurricane or severe low pressure center is indeed a huge vacuum. It was literally sucking in air from Texas as well as moist air from other parts of the overheated Gulf of Mexico. As the morning wore on, hundreds of people came down to see the breakers. Children and adults enjoyed the cooler north wind while playing in the increasingly large waves. Intermittent blue sky and orange hued clouds reigned overhead. One observer of the morning's activities at the beach was Walter W. Davis of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He was in Galveston on business, and as a resident of a landlocked state, he was not accustomed to seeing the ocean. When he heard people in his hotel talking about the huge breakers, he was compelled to pay a visit to the beach and see them crash ashore. As he recalled, and I quote, the sight was grand at first. I watched the waves wash out and break all the shell houses, theaters, and lunchrooms until I saw the waves were coming too close for comfort, end of quote. Even though the hurricane was sending forth plenty of warnings, Davis walked back to his hotel through water-choked streets, often knee-high, ate lunch in the hotel's dining room, and then gave in to his curiosity by leaving the inn and venturing to the bay side that's the north side of the island. He stood on a high sidewalk and gazed in amazement as water from the bay invaded the streets before and behind him. He noted that he could see the water rising and shortly he became nervous. When the water careened over the sidewalk and washed over his feet, he became extremely nervous. He did not know it, but he and the population of Galveston were witnessing storm surge and the eye wall of the hurricane was still dozens of miles out to sea. Even at half past noon, there still were no hurricane warnings. In his report to the Weather Bureau on September 23rd, Isaac Klein stated that the storm warning that had been issued from Washington was sufficient and that precautions to warn people had been taken. He claimed that the warnings he issued saved thousands of lives. This is a claim disputed by the writer Eric Larson in his seminal book entitled Isaac's Storm. The strength of his warning and his actions do indeed raise questions about the depth of his concern and the actions he took. As he wrote to the Weather Bureau, and I quote, 
Storm warnings were timely and received a wide distribution, not only in Galveston, but throughout the coast region. Warning messages were received from the central office at Washington on September 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. The high tide on the morning of the 8th, with storm warning flying, made it necessary to keep one man constantly at the telephone giving out information. Hundreds of people who could not reach us by telephone came to the Weather Bureau office seeking advice. I went down to Strand Street, which is a major commercial area, and advised some wholesale co commission merchants who had perishable goods on their floors to place them three feet above the floor. End of quote. These warnings were not nearly enough to save the city's residents from the unnamed hurricane's wrath. Throughout most of the day and early evening, Klein or his staff recorded barometric pressure as well as wind speed and direction. The record keeping in the midst of an emerging mass of hurricanes shows that they believed that they were relatively safe. In his September 23rd report, Klein recalled that he went to work at 5 a.m. and throughout the morning made several trips between his office and the beach. Torrential rain began falling at noon. He was concerned because upon his first visit to the beach that morning, he noted that heavy swells, which were occurring at high tide, were overflowing the low places in the southern portion of the city. Despite his apprehension, his instruments did not tell him that a hurricane was developing. His reluctance to accept the fact that a hurricane was heading full force for his low-lying island was reinforced by other, less reliable assumptions. And I quote, The usual signs which herald the approach of hurricanes were not present in this case. The brick-dust sky was not in evidence to the smallest degree. End of quote. Here I think Klein was relying on the old saying which traces all the way back to the Bible, Book of Matthew, I believe, Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. I think in the Bible it refers to shepherds and not sailors, though. Furthermore, he did not observe any nimbus or rain-making clouds until afternoon. And I quote again, Broken stratus and stratocumulus clouds predominated during the early forenoon of the 8th, with blue sky visible here and there. Dense clouds and heavy rain were not in evidence until about noon after which dense clouds with rain prevailed." End of quote. It was at this time that Walter W. Davis had watched water rising from the bay. While Isaac went home for lunch at 3.30, Joseph stayed at the office to send an update describing the flooding conditions to Washington. He discovered that the city's telegraph wires were down and that only one telephone line connecting the island to the outside world was working. Joseph was eventually able to make a call to Houston and gave officials there this report. Gulf rising. Water covers streets of about half the city. That's at 3.30. That was the last report filed until after the storm subsided. The eye wall was still nearly five hours away. Winds reached hurricane force at about 5 p.m. Hurricane force be 74 miles per hour for at least a minute. The uh, highest wind speed recorded that day was 100 miles per hour, and that was at 6.15 p.m. But according to Klein, the anemometer, the wind gauge, blew away at that time. Given the fact that the eye wall did not make landfall until after 8 p.m., and that Klein described the wind after its passage to be a greater fury than before, Wind velocity at the storm's peak was probably in excess of 150 miles per hour. That would put it on a threshold between a Category 4 and a Category 5 on the Simpson uh, safer scale. Klein, however, estimated maximum velocity of 120. It's important to point out that Klein did not use the term eye wall in his report. Nonetheless, it is possible to determine the time of the passage of the eye wall by noting Klein's description of atmospheric conditions as well as shifts and wind directions. He noted that after 8 p.m. there was a distinct lull. He also wrote that the wind then shifted from the northeast and the northwest to the southeast and south after the lull. That Klein or anyone else for that matter survived a direct hit from a category 4 and perhaps a category 5 is astonishing. Having a well-built multi-story home located a few blocks from the beach at an elevation of 5.2 feet above sea level just two feet short of the highest elevation on the 30-mile-long island. Klein believed that he and his family were safe in it, and so did dozens of his neighbors. When Klein went home for lunch at 3.30, he found that the water around his house was waist-deep. 
signifying an 8-foot storm surge several blocks inland from the shore. By 8 p.m., 40 to 50 people had taken refuge in its house. Just before debris or a tornado, because there are tornadoes in Iowa of hurricanes, knocked down the sturdy house from its foundation at 8.30 p.m. Klein noted that water was 15 feet deep at his residence, making a storm surge of just over 20 feet. At the beach, storm surge was probably 25 to 30 feet above normal levels. Of the 50 or so people who went into the Black Torrent, only 18 survived. Among those who perished was Klein's wife, Cora, who was pregnant at the time. When the house collapsed into the tide, Isaac and his brother Joseph were able to find uh, Isaac's three children. Together with several other survivors, they climbed aboard a pile of floating debris, clung for their lives, and were pushed out to sea by waves, and then washed back towards shore. Three hours later, they landed on someone's home, some 300 yards from where his house stood. By 8 a.m. on Sunday morning, the wind was blowing from the south at 20 miles per hour, but more importantly, the water had receded. Of the city's population of 29,000 people, the homes of 20,000 of them, according to Klein's report, were destroyed. While Klein estimated that the loss of lives to be 6,000, writer Eric Larson provides a higher estimate of at least 8,000. Because Klein had the responsibility of issuing warnings that would have saved lives, Larson contends that Klein had good reason to issue a conservative estimate of the loss of life. Larson also contends that despite Klein's confidence in his warnings, they were clearly inadequate. And I agree with Larson's assessment. Isaac Klein concluded his report of September 23, 1900 with a comment that the high death toll was the result of waves. He further argued that more lives would have been saved had there been a seawall built in the Gulf. In the wake of the storm, such a structure was constructed. However, as Klein pointed out in his report, airborne debris killed many people as they tried to flee the city, which was an impossible task because bridges were washed out and boats could not sail in the bay. At any rate, a seawall would not have saved them from airborne projectiles. In the final analysis of the Galveston storm of September 8, 1900, it is doubtful that a seawall would have protected the city. Walter W. Davis's description of bayside flooding shows that the island, which in effect was a seawall for the bay, could not stop the water from rising. Given the hurricanes are one of nature's means to disperse surplus energy into zones of energy deficit, they will return. The Gulf of Mexico is certainly not immune from them. While developers could build homes and businesses out of wind-resistant materials and even place them on stilts, there are uncontrollable factors that make it nearly impossible to make any low-lying coastal settlement in the Gulf completely safe. Klein's home was built on an elevated foundation, but it was debris or a tornado that knocked the house into the raging sea. Trees and other natural features can and will become high-velocity missiles, or torpedo, torpedoes. Given our penchant for living near large water bodies and our confidence in technology to overcome nature's forces, human population will increase in places like New Orleans and Galveston. At the risk of sounding like an alarmist, it is nevertheless important to state that at some unknown time in the future, a storm will develop over the North Equatorial Current. It will be fed by solar energy from the sea through the hydrologic cycle. Stable atmospheric conditions will empower the storm to strengthen and move over the Gulf of Mexico. It will be a Category 5, and it will be a killer.